Hello, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Drake McGraw and I'm the commander of the 32nd Civil Support Team located at Fort Meade, Maryland. Our mission is to support civil authorities at an all-hazard or chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, or explosive events. We do this by assessing the current situation and the projected consequences of the event, and then advising the incident commander on response measures and assisting with requests for additional support. We have a variety of capabilities that can assist an incident commander from a robust mobile communication suite to a laboratory capable of agent identification and sample analysis. Each of these capabilities will be explored in the following segments. My name is Master Sergeant Chris Bolt, Operations NCO and Modeling NCO for the 32nd Civil Support Team. The 32nd Civil Support Team is a weapons of mass destruction, sea burning response team, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive. We are a 22-man, full-time National Guard team comprised of both airmen and Army. There are seven sections in the CST. The command section is the commander, deputy commander, the first sergeant, the administration NCO, logistics NCO. The commo section is a infosyst and a communications NCO. The medical section has a physician's assistant, a medical ops officer, a nuclear medical science officer and a medical NCO. The operations section has an operations officer, a modeling slash operations NCO, and a training assistant ops NCO. The survey team consists of eight people. Survey team leader, a recon NCO, two team chiefs, and each team has two team members. Once we get a call, we have 90 minutes from the time the call comes in to the time we need to roll out with the ad bond. This vehicle I'm getting in now is the Advan vehicle. This vehicle is the first vehicle out the door once we get called. In this vehicle are the commander, the first sergeant, the operations modeling NCO, and the survey team leader. Once we're en route, this vehicle here provides communication capabilities to keep in constant contact with the incident commander. What we're trying to get from the incident commander is as much intel as possible. As we are moving, we have internet capability. We have satellite phone capability and we have traditional phone capability. We also have radio communication. Normally, as the modeler, I'm in the back seat. I am setting up a situation where I can have isolation zones and downwind hazards done by the time we arrive on scene. Once we arrive on scene, the commander will link up with the incident commander and try to get as much information as possible on what is needed of us. The survey team leader is speaking with anyone he can to get any intel about what's going on downrange and the first sergeant is checking out the area to see where we can pull our vehicles in so we can have a footprint as small as possible. One of the assets that we provide is on-site modeling. What this is here, this is a product that I would give the incident commander to let the incident commander know that if something were to get out with the weather that we have on the current site, this is possibly the pattern that it will take. And what this does, it allows the incident commander to know, hey, I potentially have a larger problem here. I may have to evacuate this area. I may have to put monitoring this area, and my incident just got bigger. This is real time on scene, meaning I'm doing it as we speak. I'm constantly updating this. I am constantly making sure that everything is accurate according to the weather. Uh, the reason that this product is so valuable is that this is a Department of Defense only tool. This is not something that firemen have access to. This is provided from the Department of Defense to the Department of Defense. This is a military product, meaning that it has military grade weapons in it. It has anthrax, it has RDDs, it has nuclear explosions, it has all the chemical warfare agents listed in it, and it's very specific to that. Also, what this can do is it can tell the people that are in these certain colored areas what their level of threat is. It's pretty common that red is bad. So most of the time when you see red, that usually means there's a fatality or casualty or mortality issue going on in that area. What this also can do is also can create a, a scenario where they don't have to panic as much. A lot of people don't have a clear understanding of chemical weapons, so they automatically think that everywhere it goes is bad. A lot of times what this means is that although the cloud is moving this way, maybe all you have to do is monitor to make sure that it didn't get further out and people can just shelter in place. You may not have to evacuate. That's what this tool provides. Hello, I'm Captain Michael Case, Survey Section Leader for the 32nd Weapons of Mass Destruction Civil Support Team. 
Detection and area monitoring are all contained within our survey section using state-of-the-art monitoring equipment. Survey team members will go downrange into the hot zone and utilize state-of-the-art monitoring equipment in order to locate and identify potential seaburn hazards. As the incident develops and the survey team is operating downrange, they will collect samples, they will bring the samples out, they will follow the chain of custody for evidentiary purposes, and they will hand the samples off to the analytical lab. Thank you, Sergeant Bolt. Hi, my name is Captain Gilbert Polino, and I am the analytical science officer with the 32nd CS team. What I have behind me is the analytical laboratory system, ALS. It's a system that helps us identify unknown chemicals, biologicals, as well as ticks, toxic industrial chemicals, or TIMS, toxic industrial materials. We're also able to identify different types of radioactive isotopes uh, depending on the survey samples that are collected downrange. Initially, when we receive a sample, a chain of custody is initiated where I receive the sample. It is taken to the analytical laboratory system, ALS, uh, for processing. So come with me this way. After receiving the sample, we notify our instant command as well as operations that we have received the sample and we are ready for processing. This is Raven 1 2, sample received, ready to process. From there, samples are brought into the, our glove box where it actually is transferred into a class 3 glove box. And from there, we'll proceed with uh, initial sampling processing. Once the sample is placed into the glove box, we do an initial paper test to determine its nature. Is the sample a chemical? Is it a biological? First test that I normally run is called what's an MA paper, and that helps you identify if the compound or sample is some sort of uh, blister agent, nerve agent, or a mustard agent. From there, we try to determine if this chemical agent will oxidize your instrument and also what the pH is. From there, I'll actually process the samples through some of the instruments that I have here in the alls. I have what's called an illuminator, a microscopy, which is basically an illuminator microscope for identifying different types of white powders, a regular polarized light microscope, as well as a fluorescence microscope. A three-tier system that allows me to identify different types of white powders. So for example, if you receive the white powder, I could tell you, hey, there's a starch in there, or uh, hey, it might just be nothing, sir. Uh, nothing to report here. Next that I have is uh, what's called the PCR, or polymerized chain reaction. In this instrument here, we're able to take a small portion of DNA from a sample, amplify it 100,000 times, and make a determination of what type of biological agent it is, whether it would be anthrax, plague, or some of your ricin agents. We'd be able to make the determination on site within a few hours to report to the commander. What I have behind me is also another instrument that's very vital and uh, very important in our arsenal. Uh, it's called GCMS gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. With this instrument here, we can take a small portion of a liquid sample, actually runs into a process where it's actually fractionalized and compared to a digital spectra on what the sample may be, whether it would be a, a benzene sample or a, a fuel sample, we'd be able to pick it up in our gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Safety is always key. Uh, to ensure safety, we always wear our goggles, we always keep our mask handy, as well as body substance isolation to ensure we are protected from uh, any potential exposures here in the analytical laboratory system. Moving forward, I have an instrument here known as the M1M. The M1M is used to identify different types of toxins. Uh, again, with our uh, collection of arsenals here, we are able to identify different types of toxins from staph and terotoxins, ricins, Yersinia pestis, this instrument is key and vital in helping us identify those samples. I also have additional tools here. One is called the FT True Defender. It uses an FTIR technology to help us identify different types of white powders, agents, ticks and tims. Great technology with the True Defender is that it has the capability of sending via BlackBerry email text what the sample analysis was, which allows us to quickly expedite uh, sampling procedures on our end as well as report to the incident commander to support, assess, advise, assist uh, potential exposures. We also have an Ahura. Complement technology to FTAR uses Raman technology and also helps us identify potential samples that the FTAR might not pick up. So basically two complementing systems here. And as we run through our sample, 
Uh, she's finished completing running a sample analysis and we've determined that the sample is a citric acid. And uh, what we can do is actually compare a spectral sample analysis here, merge them with a stack overlay to make a final determination on what the sample is. And those are some of the many tools we have here in the analytical laboratory system. Hello, I'm First Sergeant Marcus Mingo. The communications section is a two-man team that consists of an IT specialist and a signal support system specialist. They provide the entire range of secure and non-secure communications across a wide spectrum of emergency responder frequencies for the WMD CST incident response. It further integrates and interoperates with the incident command system as part of the unified command suite structure to reduce confusion, improve safety, organize and coordinate actions, and facilitate effective management of the incident. It interfaces with state and local civil responders to support unity of the effort and provide situational awareness by reducing first responder information gaps and communication shortfalls. The Unified Command Suite is the primary platform to facilitate reach back for both the WMD CST and organizations that it supports, providing a critical link to follow on forces, supplies, and expertise for sea burning incidents and natural and man made disasters. It is a self contained, standalone, air transportable fielded communication system, which operates in urban and undeveloped areas using portable and fixed equipment. It provides real-time voice, data, and video communications classified through the secret level. Equipment and services provided include, but are not limited to, radios, which consist of land mobile radios, military UHF and VHF, tactical SATCOM, NMARSAT, telephones, both DNS or defense switching network and commercial. It provides data, for both Nipper and SipperNet. It also provides collaborative video and teleconferencing and ensures radio interoperability through Raytheon's ACU 1000. The communication team has a network that provides round-the-clock support 365 days a year. It provides replacement equipment, subject matter expertise, and if necessary, additional personnel on the ground. This support ranges from something as small as a wing nut to a replacement vehicle. The communication section can be requested as a standalone entity in support of local events such as the Army-Navy game, 4th of July celebrations, or other high-profile events. Hi, my name is Joe Bercato. I'm the Director of Operations for the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. Part of my responsibility here at MEMA is to command the state's emergency operations center during activations and emergencies. Prior to my life here at MEMA, I was a Deputy Chief of Special Operations for the Baltimore City Fire Department, where I served 30 years. I have a lot of experience working with the 32nd Civil Support Team. We utilize them in a number of events, such as the Preakness, fireworks displays at the Inner Harbor, to other planned events, such as the Grand Prix, and for incidents as well. It's really important to work with the Guard in that the National Guard for us becomes a force multiplier. The Guard brings us a tremendous amount of resources and command and control. Um, that's what the Guard does on a daily basis. They come into an incident with communications equipment and a good robust hazmat identification and mitigation capability. They're not there to take over. They make that very clear from the start. They're there to work with the local representatives, and I found that to be true in all the cases. Through identifying hazards, through prevention, through all the different aspects of plume modeling for communications, they are definitely a force that can help the local incident commander really do a much better job of being able to uh, have good situational awareness and in the event that something goes wrong, to be able to mitigate and identify the problem. My hope is, is that those of you at the local level will really see them as the, the group to go to for additional capabilities. I believe strongly that to utilize them in a proactive mode is much better than waiting until the need comes about and then using them reactively. Our operation in the city was to always use them proactively 
uh, so that in the event that we needed them, they were already there. The other good thing that that brought about for us was that we built the relationships with the individuals in the 32nd Civil Support Team. They understood uh, us, we understood them, our strengths and our weaknesses, and we, we built that working relationship ahead of time so that there were not any issues uh, when the need arose. Thank you for taking the time to review the capabilities of the 32nd Civil Support Team. We are here to support you anytime and can be reached by contacting the Maryland Emergency Management Agency at 410-517-3700. We are also available for training exercises and can be reached by calling 301-677-7126. Thank <laughs> you.